His family. Can we just have a shout of praise to the Lord this evening? Yes, but I, I think we must we must shout louder. Yes, with everything that's inside of us. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I need some people who are excited to be in church this evening. Are you, yes, are you excited to be here this evening? Hallelujah. Those of you who are sitting down, I doubt. I don't see your excitement. I'm just playing with you. I see Zinkle, she's up already. <laughs> are you guys excited to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. It's very good to see you all here this evening. So, so good. You look wonderful. Will you turn to your neighbor and say that to them? You look wonderful, neighbor. But don't lie to them, right? Tell them the truth. <laughs> Thank you so much. His family, thank you. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Isn't our band awesome? But not the singers so much, just the guys who play the instruments, right? It's in lane. <laughs> I'm just joking with you, right? The ones who sing are okay. <laughs> yes, they are awesome. Especially that one lady. <laughs> yeah, it's good to be here even if it is a school holiday and all of these things it's still good to be here I believe I have a word, word from the Lord for you um it's, it's something that I've been thinking about all for a while. You know, I heard someone talk about it once or just mention something about it. But I really believe that it's something that all of us can benefit from, a word that, that is really for us all. If it, maybe if it's not for this time in your life, it will come. There will be a time in your life when you, where you need to understand this word um, that the, the, the Lord, I believe, has placed on my heart for us this evening. But the first thing I want to tell you guys is, again, I know we've, we've, we've spoken about this many times. I think Pastor Warren as well, he's spoken about this, about social media. How many of you know what that is? <laughs> yes, I know you all know. Don't worry. You don't have to put up your hands. <laughs> you all know what social media is. And the thing about social media is it, it gives us access to so many different stories. Have you seen this before? So many different things. I mean, a couple of, or not a couple of years ago, but it's been a while now, but, you know, when, maybe when I was growing up, there wasn't any social media. I didn't know about earthquakes in the Middle East or uh, someone, you know, uh, uh, making war on another country in very far away. I didn't know all these things. There wasn't, we didn't have access to all of that. How many of you remember that time? <laughs> yeah. There's one who's young enough to not remember that time. <laughs> but, and, and, I, and I heard someone speak about it like this. He said, we have all this access to everything, all the, everything that's happening in, on the earth now, we know because of social media, because of news that we have. And it's awesome, right? It's, it's, it's really wonderful. But the side effect of this is that we all get bombarded with negativity with difficulty, difficulty happening in the earth. And there's so many places that it's happening over and over and over again. And all of a sudden we think that it, this, is, this is the worst that it's ever been, ever. It's never been this bad. But the reason we think that way is because we have access to it. We actually hear about it. We see it happening on our phones everywhere we go. We see these things happening. But the actual fact is, is that it's been happening. Bad things have been happening. They've been earthquakes forever. They've been there. Um, people have done stupid things always. How many of you know that? Some of us are here. <laughs> but, you know, it's always happened. People have done really bad things always. It's always been like that. Since, since the day, you know, when, when they ate of the fruit in the garden, bad things have been happening. And good things have been happening as well. But what I heard this guy say, he says this, he says that he doesn't believe that us as humans have the emotional capability of receiving all of that negativity. 
all of a sudden we receive all of that stuff, all of, that, all of the things happening around us, all of the things happening, and we see it, and it, bec- it goes into our minds, and all of a sudden we feel like we have to start processing everything that is happening around us. We do not have the emotional capability or capacity to do that. Only God has that capacity, that emotional capacity to handle everything, to be able to know what's going on everywhere all at once. Are you guys with me? The reason I'm telling you this is because I want you to be aware of what you see on your phone. Everything, make sure that you see it through the right filter. Because we can see many things. And we make a, 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 also we make some, we make some, I want to say deductions about, about it. We make up something. We see, a, we see a thing, we make our own um, assumptions, thank you, assumptions about this thing that is happening. And all of a sudden, it becomes so much, so, such a part of me. Like, I, I struggle with it. <laughs> I, I, in be, I lie in bed at night, and all of a sudden, that's what I'm thinking about. The stuff I saw on social media that's happening in another country that has nothing to do with me. Are you guys with me? Has that happened to you before? Because it's happened to me. <laughs> it happens in a different country, and all of a sudden, it becomes my resp- I feel like it's my responsibility. I have to uh, uh, try and process this in my mind, and... The Lord has never planned that for me. So I have to be able to know this, right? I just want you guys to to hear that. You have to be able to know that. To know which things are yours to process and which are not. Jesus, when he was on the earth, he came as a man. He was 100% man. He was 100% God. But he did not process everything. He did not talk about everything happening on the earth. How many of you know that Israel wasn't the only country on earth when Jesus was on earth? There was other ones as well. He didn't process everything with the people around him that happened in other countries. Only the stuff that happened here right in front of him. That's the things uh, that, he, that, he, that he handled, if I, can, if I can call it that way. The person right in front of him, that was the, the person he spoke to. The people he healed was the ones right in front of him. Are you guys with me? He even speaks about one thing that happens, uh, uh, um, a tragedy that happens when a, I think it was a building that collapsed on, on some, some people and, and they died. He wasn't there. He couldn't do anything about it. Are you guys okay with that? Like you can't do everything. You can't do anything about something happening in a different country. <laughs> and that's okay. It's okay like that. But the Lord has given us something, each and every single one of us. We have something that he wants us to do right here that's in front of us. If we do not... If we do not um, you know, take that thing, take that opportunity, take that uh, call, that purpose that the Lord has placed on our lives and we run with it. We won't be able to, uh, you know, go further. You won't be able to entrust us with more things. Are you guys with me? You know, we've heard this before many times. We always talk about it when it comes to, when it comes to giving and it comes to money as well. If we are not faithful in, in the little that we receive, um, you will not be able to entrust us with much, but it's the same thing with the purpose he's placed on our life as well. It doesn't start out as a massive purpose, as a, or as this big, huge thing um, that we are busy with immediately. It starts out as something small. And we always take, take it back to um, uh, uh, the reason we, I believe preachers and pastors and all of us do this, take it back to where we are, where we have preached to uh, small amounts of people. We take it back there because that's what we know. That's our purpose. But for each and every single one of us, there's something different like that. You've started somewhere else. You know, I, uh, I, um, this morning um, there was a man who was, who was preaching and he said, not, not that, <laughs> you know, Pastor Warren was also preaching. I wasn't there. I was somewhere else. But this this uh, brother of ours, he was preaching and he mentioned where he came from. Like he started out in a, um, in a rural area. But when you see him now, you will not believe that it's possible for him to come from that place. But, but he was faithful with what the Lord gave him when it was still small, when it was still a little. He was faithful with that. Amen? That was free. That was just the whole, everything that I just said was for free. I didn't prepare that, so you are lucky that you are here to hear that. Amen. <laughs> but this evening, I, w- I want to talk about, let me get to my message, right? The, the message that I want to share with you is, and I believe this is, this is something that, that many people have gone through or will go through at some point in life. My question is, are you bored with Jesus? And we can... You know, when I go to you, when I come, come and, and sit in front of you and I ask you this question, friend, brother, sister, are you bored with Jesus? 
you're going to tell me no. Amen? I won't say yes to that ever. <laughs> you won't hear me say that. But we have to know that sometimes it does happen in our lives. We do get to this place where we, where we aren't as passionate about him as we were or as we, as we can be. And we, we have to be able to realize this, to be able to pinpoint the, the, that thing so that we can eradicate it. We can take it away. Are you guys okay with that? So we're going to talk about that. Are we bored with Jesus? And we find many people who are, especially since, um, and it's unfortunate that, we have to, that, I, that I have to mention it this way, but there's that thing that happened in everyone's life that was huge. It, was, it, it, it brought a massive span, you know, in the, in the works. It, it was just crazy, this whole thing. And unfortunately, it happened to everyone. But the pandemic, the, 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 the lockdown happened to everyone. And all of a sudden, people are bored with Jesus. They don't realize it, but they become um, familiar with Jesus. They become, and, and, and familiarity with Jesus can be good, but there's also an, a negative side to that as well. When I get comfortable, so much so that I don't even want to listen to him anymore. I don't realize the anointing that is on him anymore. And I want, there's a story in the Old Testament it's in 2 Kings uh, chapter 20, right, verse, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna read from verse one, and we're gonna go through that story just quickly. So I show you, I wanna show you what happens, or what, what can happen if we get bored with Jesus, if we get to a place in our life where we, uh, you know, aren't, again, as passionate as we should be about Jesus and, and, and what he's able to do in our lives. It says in 2, two Kings, Okay, I'm going to remember to come back to this. What is the, uh, you know, what does it look like to be bored with Jesus? What is it? Because we need to know that, right? If I start coming to church less, if I start praying less, if I start reading the Bible less, I become familiar with it. Even sometimes we read the Bible and we, and we like, my, like we've, you know, it, happens to, it happened to me before as well. We read the Bible and, and I just go over Go over the verse, John 3, 16. I just go over the verse. I know this verse. I've read it so many times. I've heard it everywhere. I just go over the verse. I read the next one. I don't really know what the next one says, and I just go on, and I just read the, read, read the chapter, finish the chapter, just to say that I've read the Bible today. But I don't sit with it. I don't digest what it says. I don't do my best to understand everything that it says, that it understands, that I understand everything that the verse implies in my life, to, or to my life. So in 2, two Kings 20, verse 1 to 11, it says, it's a story about Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, and it says, in those days Hezekiah was sick and near death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. What an amazing word from the Lord. I'm sure Hezekiah was jumping up and down shouting, Hallelujah, the prophet spoke to me. <laughs> Verse 2 says, Then he turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Now, you have to get this. The type of of humility that Hezekiah showed at this moment was astounding. It was amazing. So much so that the follow, following thing happens in verse 4. It says, And it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, saying, Now, I want you to see this. Isaiah was just out of the room. He, was just, he just went to the next room. Hezekiah was already praying. The prophet went into the next room. Hezekiah's prayer was so I don't know how to explain it. Humility maybe is the best thing to explain it or, or something. I don't know. It was so powerful that the Lord spoke to Isaiah in the next room, made him turn back and come give him a new word. Come give Hezekiah a new word. A change of situation. It says, this is what the Lord spoke to Isaiah in the next room. He says, return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. 
I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. And then he says to him, On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add to your days 15 years. I will deliver you and the city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend the city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. Can you imagine that? Isaiah just walked into the next room. He gave the king a prophetic word. He told him, you're going to die. It's the end of your life. He walks into the next room. Hezekiah's prayer, I mean, I don't know how to, exp- how to explain because I, I don't know what that is, how he prayed. But he wept bitterly, right? He wept before the Lord. He reminded the Lord, this is who I am. This is what you made me to be. And then the, the word changed. It became a positive one. He added 15 years to his life. But then it says, Then Isaiah said, Take a lump of figs. So they took and, took and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. So Hezekiah was busy recovering. Why, right? He was sick. They, 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 they gave him some, some, some medicine, and he started to get better. But now, this is the, the, the place, the, the, you know, the, the time where things go wrong, I believe, for Hezekiah. Hezekiah got bored with the word that was spoken over his life. And all of a sudden, the spoken word from the prophet wasn't enough anymore. And I'll show you um, what I mean by that. God already told him that he was going to heal him, right? He told him, like, listen, I'm going to add 15 years to your life on the third day when you go up into the temple. This is what he told him, right? It says into the temple. I, I can't remember. Into the house of the Lord, yes. So into the temple. And verse 8, Hezekiah said to Isaiah, he says, and this is, the, this is the point where I think Hezekiah gets bored. He says, what is the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I should go up to the house of the Lord the third day? Like he's like, he's thinking to himself, like what you, whatever you said, prophet, was nice, but it's not enough. I want greater detail. <laughs> Tell me more. So he's got, he, he got bored with the word that the Lord spoke over his life, he told him, like, this is the instruction, I'm going to heal you. I'm going to add 15 years to your life. On, and on the third day, when you go up into the temple, into the house of the Lord, that's when it's going to happen. And Hezekiah is like, you know what, I, I don't know. Are you guys with me? You understand what I'm trying to say? He gets familiar with the word of the Lord, and he says, that's not enough anymore. I want something else. Tell me something else, prophet. So... And we've seen this happen in church. I have seen this in, in happening in church with some people is that they get bored with Jesus. They get familiar with Jesus. They get familiar with the word that's being preached to them. And all of a sudden, they start running after prophets because they want the prophecy. They want a new word over their life. Yes. And it says in verse 9, Then Isaiah said, This is the sign to you from the Lord. That the Lord will do the thing which he has spoken. Now we ask the question, shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or go back 10 degrees? And for Hezekiah, he could have chosen one of the, one of the two. He says, you know, you can choose, is time going to go forward 10 minutes or time going to go back 10 minutes? I say 10 minutes, I don't know how many degrees it, it was in that time. And Hezekiah answered and it says, it's an easy thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. Now he's testing God. He's testing the Lord because why? He's, he's, he's bored. He's familiar. He's now been able, he, 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 he had the opportunity to get his prayer answered, you know, and his prayer was answered. And all of a sudden, that's not good enough anymore. Now I want other things as well. I want different signs. And so he, Isaiah asks him, which one do you want? And he says, it's easy for the, for the, for the shadow to go, um, you know, down 10 degrees so for time to move forward, that's an easy thing because it's going to happen, right? That shouldn't be the sign. He says, no, but let the shadow go backward 10 degrees. So he's like, make time go backwards. And so Isaiah the prophet cried out to the Lord, and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward by which it had gone down on the sundial of Ayaz. And all of a sudden, with, with all of this, right, Hezekiah now is in this position where he thinks he is untouchable. He can do anything, he can do what he wants, nothing's going to happen to him because he's got 15 years. Everything's going to be fine for at least 15 years. So, but, but now he's, taking, he's obviously taking chances. You guys see this, right? 
that this is amazing that the Lord was able to do this. It's crazy that the Lord was, was, that did, actually did it for him. But Ezekiah took a chance. Like, I know I, I did that when I, when I was a child as well. Maybe I still do. I remember this one time we went in, into a shop and, and my, my, you know, we, me and my brother, we wanted something in the shop. I think it was a sweet or a chocolate or maybe just, you know, a ball or something. I can't remember exactly what it was. And we know that they, they like to buy us things, our, my parents, right? Our parents like to buy us things. So we run to, with this thing, I run to my mother. I'm like, mom, please, can we have this thing? She says, no, you cannot have this thing. And then I get, I make, I make the decision. I'm going to take a chance. I'm going to be bored with the no <laughs> and run to my dad and ask him because they're not standing with each other, right? They're not close to each other. I run to my dad. I'm like, dad, can we have this thing? He says, yes. <laughs> and then we get to the till and my mom sees that we want to pay. And this was a big mistake. I mean, it was a massive mistake to do this, right? And we, we wanted to pay, and we put this thing there for them, for them to pay, for, to buy. You know, I'm going to say it was chocolate. I don't remember. And my mom sees this thing, and she's like, I told you, you cannot have this. And when my dad heard that my mom had already said no, yo, flames, brother. <laughs> he was so angry with us, right? But why? Because we took chances, we took a chance. We got, we were, you know, when I, when I say bored, we got familiar with the answer of no from my mom. And we ran, ran to dad because we thought, yes, he's going to say yes. He's, gonna, he's not going to say no to us this time. And so it, it ended badly for us. It did not end on a good note. Are you guys with me? So now Hezekiah, in this moment, gets a prayer answered. He takes a chance, which I believe he shouldn't have done. He takes a chance on the next thing, like, uh, I'm bored with this answer that you've given me, Lord, but, you know, show me something else as well. And the Lord does this because the Lord is gracious and he is good, right? And he shows mercy to everyone. <laughs> now, the story goes on in 2 Kings 20, verse 15 to 17. Now, I just, I just want to give you a quickly background. The, the king of Babylon comes to Hezekiah, to Israel, to come and see all the greatness that Israel is under King Hezekiah. Hezekiah has built a magnificent um, kingdom, and, and, you, and you have to understand this, that Hezekiah was one of these kings that the Lord really loved. Like, he really loved this guy, He's, because Hezekiah's heart, when he started out, was fully devoted to the Lord. He's one of these that, that, uh, that, that God spoke about, I, I, I told you this before, that the Bible actually says there was none like him before him or after him. Hezekiah, a great king, but the end of his life is not so magnificent. So he invites these, uh, or, or the Babylonian kings come to his house, uh, to the temple, or, you know, to his house, to, these, to his kingdom, and, and to see what, what he has. And he shows them everything. He doesn't hide anything from them. He shows them everything that they have, every single piece of gold, every single piece of jewelry that Hezekiah has in his house, he shows the Babylonians. And it says um, that the prophet again came to, came, came to Hezekiah, Isaiah, he says, and he said, what have they seen in your house? So Isaiah is asking Hezekiah this question. And so Hezekiah answered and he says, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. He thought he was untouchable because, he had added, because God had added 15 years to his life. He thought nothing was going to go wrong. And the Lord answered these questions in a time where, where he took chances. The fact that he showed the Babylonians everything that he had just shows us the lack of wisdom that he had at that time. He showed them exactly how to get into the house, or how to steal everything that is in his house. The lack of wisdom goes on with, with, with Hezekiah when he, he says to, to Isaiah, when Isaiah prophesies this over his life, he says to Isaiah, what you have spoken is good. At least it will not be in my lifetime. He says, I don't care. 
what you have spoken because I know I'm, I'm going to be dead in 15 years or however long he had left by that time. I'm going to be dead by then, so my children is going to be there, so it's not my problem anymore. He got bored with Jesus. His devotion, his heart wasn't fully devoted to God anymore. Now this is something that we have to guard our hearts against, is to not become bored with Jesus. I've seen, you know, I, I, I'm always reminded of these people on, on social media again, you know, people who are, um, they always give, always criticize other, other people, other, other pastors. I've seen this one guy, it, it's, a, it's, it's crazy, it's amazing to me that, that it's allowed. <laughs> But there's this, there's this guy who, who, who literally, he takes a sermon, he watches the sermon, and everywhere he disagrees, he pauses and then he talks to, the, to his followers on, on, in social media and tells them whatever this pastor says is not right, here and there and this and that. This is like, I can't imagine how people spend their time doing that. But I know why. Because they are bored with Jesus. He is not fully inside of their life anymore. They start looking for, uh, or, or, you know, they, they want to be, they, they want to look like the smart ones. It's not about him anymore. It's not about Jesus anymore. It's become about me. This is when I become bored with Jesus, when it starts becoming about myself and my, my stuff and not about him anymore. When I, I, I always think about this song, there's this song that we sing and, and we've sung it here in church as well. Uh, and it just goes, holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 all the time. Like I, I remember we sang this song one evening, I think it was two or three weeks ago, in the evening service, we sang that song. And for a moment, in, while we were singing that, for a moment it came in my, up in my mind that maybe we are bored with singing the, the same words over and over and over again. Holy, holy, holy. But then I remind myself that in heaven, that is what is being sung over and over and over and over again. They never stop, they never get bored by singing the same thing. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who was and is and is to come. Like they just sing that over and over and over again. And they do not get bored with it. Why? Because they sit in the presence of the Almighty One. They sit in the presence of God. And they don't get bored with that. Why? You guys get this, right? That you don't get bored when you sit in the presence of God. It's impossible for you to get bored when you are sitting in the presence of God. Your passion will not go away. When you keep on sitting with Him. In Mark 6 verse 1 to 6 it says... Then he went out from there. Now we are in the, in the New Testament. Hallelujah. <laughs> he went out from there and came to his own country. And his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come. Now I want you guys to see this. Because there's a double um, lesson to be learned in this message. In this, in this portion of the message at least. In his own country and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come. He began to teach in the synagogue. And many Hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is the wisdom, or, or, and what wisdom is this which is given to him? That such mighty works are performed by his hands. Is this not the carpenter, carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him because they were familiar with him. They got offended that the, that the guy who they knew did amazing things. Okay, this is not a, it's not a, um, th this happens a lot. That the guy you know, the one that looks like supposed to be, be able to do nothing, starts doing something. And you start getting offended because this one, how is it possible that he's being blessed like this? Or how is it possible that, <laughs> you know, my, my brother is doing better than I am? We get offended by these things. The same thing happens here with Jesus. They get offended by him. And, but Jesus says this to them. He says, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. So we see this, that the people from Nazareth became familiar with Jesus and their familiarity Offended, or got themselves offended with him, with Jesus. That ended up in offense. Instead of their familiarity with him ending up by greater faith, because that's what it should have been. They should have been familiar with him, seeing that this man who was with us all this time is now great. 
God must have been doing something in his life. And then they realize, they should have realized and seen the anointing that God has placed on this man's life, on Jesus' life. But they didn't. Again, I do not believe that Jesus said this. He, he said that, you, the quote, he says, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. I don't believe that, that he said this to make it a commandment or to make it a rule, that this is, a, this is the way it's supposed to be. I don't, I don't believe this, because otherwise Jesus would not have been marveled at their unbelief. I do believe that it does happen, that, that people do still get offended when a prophet is risen in their family, among their relatives. It does happen. But I do not believe that it's supposed to be that way. But the thing is, is that Jesus cannot do anything about it. You saw that, right? Jesus couldn't convince them that he was the son of God. They decided for themselves, we know this man, and he's, he's just that guy. He's just the guy that, that we saw, we saw him grow up. We don't believe that all this mighty works that, he, that he's doing is real. So they get offended with him. They get bored with Jesus. Again, I don't believe that this is the way it's supposed to be. The double lesson that, that I, that I want to teach on this is that this is the thing. We get, we get or bored with Jesus and we stop seeing what he's able to do in our situations. The same thing happens in church. We get bored with hearing from the same voice. And all of a sudden, nothing happens in my life anymore. When I, when I say that, I, when I say, I'm not saying that's you guys, right? This is a difficult thing, but I don't know. I can say it. Can I say it? I just, can just speak this. Sometimes we get bored with the man of God. And now everyone's very quiet because he's sitting here. You cannot say yes now. <laughs> but I've seen this happen before in church. People get, get bored with when they hear the same person preach. Doesn't matter what anointing God has placed on, that guy, on, on him. They get bored with that anointing. With, with, no, not with the anointing. They get familiar with the person. They hear the same voice. They see the mannerisms. They get bored. And all of a sudden, They disappear. But we, we, what, what we don't see is the life falling apart when they leave. Because we don't understand that it's not about the man and his mannerisms or, you know, the fact that he says God is good. It's not about that. It's about the anointing that God has placed on his life. No one can take it away. Nobody can take it away. It's not leaving. It's there. But the thing that we can do is we can choose, am I going to access the anointing that's upon him, on the man of God of this house? Am I going to access the anointing or not? That's up to me. Yes. There's very many different ways how we do that, how we access that anointing that's on the man of God. The, the, you know, we've spoken about this before. It's very quiet because they turned off the, the fan now. <laughs> But the, the, there's many ways of accessing that anointing. One of the ways that's very easy is giving into their lives. You access that anointing. Another way of doing it is by actually following. Like Elijah and Elisha, Elisha followed Elijah everywhere he went. And he got that anointing. He was, he was fed by that anointing. The same with Jesus and his disciples. The disciples, wherever Jesus was, that is where they were going to be. They weren't going to leave Jesus. They did at one point, but they came back later, <laughs> which was good. They came back later to, to access the anointing that was on Jesus' life. It's the same for us. We have access to, to the anointing that God has placed on our mom and dad. But it's our choice. Are we going to access it? Are we going to go after that or not? Are we going to, because you have to understand that it's the, it's the anointing that, takes the way, that breaks the yoke. Right? So there's an anointing that they've received that breaks yokes off of us as, as people. There's so many different stories that they can tell you of how people have, have gone from one place to the next place since they've come under their ministry or in the ministry in this church, where they've gone from this down nowhere, nothing's happening in their life, to the next place in their life. Quickly. It happened quickly. Why? Because they fought the battle to, to be able to give that away. And this is the love that they have for us, is that they will give it to us. 
They won't keep it for themselves. Amen? <laughs> oh, you guys understand? You guys understand what I'm saying, right? Now, again, we have the choice. Are we going to access the anointing? Are we going to access the gifting that God has placed on the, on the, on the pastors of this church? Okay, that's the, that's the other lesson I wanted to tell you. But now I want to get back to the personal relationship again. Am I going to access the anointing that's in the Word of God? Am I going to access that and not get bored with Jesus because there's always passion available. When I start reading the word, there's always passion available to, do, to, uh, you know, to renew whatever is in my life. Um, again, it's our own responsibility to realize what is inside of the, inside of the Bible for us. Again, the same thing, it's our responsibility to realize what the anointing is, what, is being, what has been placed on the man and woman of God of this house so that we can access it. It's not their responsibility to come and try and show us what it is. Are you guys okay with that? They don't have to, we don't, they don't have to perform to stand up here and, and start running up and down, stop jumping and shouting so that someone would listen. It's our responsibility to realize God has put something on them and we have access to that. We have access to something that's going to take us from this place to the next place. Amen? I want you guys to see this in the, in the book of, or in the New Testament. Jesus, part of this, um, what, I, what I now read in Mark, they said these people who were speaking uh, says this, is he not, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph now? You remember James? Okay, you just remember James? I'm asking you to remember him. James, Joseph, Judas, and, and Simon. So Judas, his other name is Jude. Okay. Or translated. So remember James and Jude, brothers of Jesus. These two were supposed to be part of the ones that were not able to see that Jesus was a prophet sent for them. This is what Jesus said, right? You guys forget. Jesus said this, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives. So his brothers, his sisters, was not going to know who he is. Or wasn't going to see the anointing that's on him. But we see this, and this is the reason I say that I don't think Jesus said this as, this is set in stone, it's always going to be this way. I believe we have the opportunity to change it. James and Jude both do that. In, the, in, the, in their books, in the, in the book of James, 1 verse 1, James calls himself this. He says, this is James writing himself, right? He says, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He could have said, a bondservant of God and the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he does not. He says he is a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ because he realized the anointing that's upon Jesus. The same thing happens with Jude in the, um, you know Jude has many chapters, one of the biggest books in the Bible. I'm just playing with you. It's only one chapter. It says in, in, in verse 1 of that chapter, <laughs> it says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, and not brother of Jesus, the brother of James, the one who wrote that previous book. <laughs> a bondservant of Jesus. Again, two relatives of that person who were familiar with him, who grew up with him. You know, they saw him being the carpenter. You know, if it was in cricket, cricketing terms or, or, or our terms, I say cricketing terms because that's how me and my brother uh, spent our time playing cricket. We saw each other. We knew each other, right? We, everything we did. I saw the mistakes he made. He saw the mistakes I made. I was there when he did good things. He was there when I did good things. We were there. We got hidings together. We got all of these things together, right? Everything. The same thing must have happened with, with Jesus and James and Judas. They grew up together. They were in the same house. But these two were able to see that God has done something different in our brother's life. He is not the same as everyone else. Even if he was for a moment, if he, if, if, even if he was the same for the first 30 years of his life, he was the same as everyone else. Now he is not anymore because there's something different that happened in his life. Amen? Our responsibility again, and I like using the word bored, but it's 
our responsibility is not to become bored with Jesus, not to become so familiar with him that we think, oh, it's okay, I've read the Bible before. I know what it says. And I don't apply it in my life. When the word of the Lord is spoken, like Ezekiah did this thing, the word of the Lord was spoken and he was, he was familiar with it, he was uh, bored with it, because the, the prophet obviously spoke to him before as well. He had received many prophecies in his lifetime, and now he became bored with the prophetic word, with the first word that the Lord had spoken, and he wanted other things. He wanted different stuff. He didn't realize that all the power of God was in that one word spoken to him. This is the same for us. When we read the Bible, that is what it is. It's the Word of God. And every, all the power that God has is in the Word of God. I saw, a, uh, um, or I, I want to actually share this testimony with you guys. Uh, a lady in the, in the week, she, she, she's in our church. She had a, a problem with her eye. She came forward for prayer one Sunday morning. We, I prayed with her. And... Um, the, uh, uh, I was swollen, right? And it didn't get healed immediately. Like she said, it felt a bit better as we prayed. And I just said, uh, said to her, look, listen, we're, gonna, we're just going to keep on praying for it. We're not going to stop, you know, because I believe the power of the, of the word. I believe that if I don't give up, it's going to work. So I see her once, one other time, I see her outside of the church and it's still swollen. I ask her, how's the eye going? And she says, no, it's better. It's going well. Um, and, I, and I tell her again, I'm going to keep on praying for you. In this week, Someone else from the church sends me the, uh, a WhatsApp that this lady sent to them to ask them to speak, to, you know, just forward Pastor Ivan the testimony of what had happened. My eye is clear, it's healed. And she says this, that she even went for, for MRI to see if there's cancer. And she says this, she was very afraid, obviously. If someone mentions cancer, we get afraid. We shouldn't. But... Okay, so she was inside of this thing, and she says to us, she says this, she spoke it with her own mouth. This is not going to be me. This is not going to happen to me. I believe that I am healed, right? And she says inside of this MRI scan, she starts shaking. And, and this time it's not about fear. She wasn't shaking for fear. And she's healed. Like, everything that was wrong with her eye is healed. The swelling is gone. Everything is gone. Why? Because she spoke it. She spoke the word of God over her own life. Not only did she do that, she came to receive prayer as well. She came to receive part of that anointing that's upon this church for healing, right? On Sunday morning last week, there was a woman who came to church as well. She came with, an, with a knee problem. Again, like I tell you the stories that I prayed for, you know, the ones I prayed for at least, because that's the ones I know. The others, people don't tell me for some reason. I would like them to tell me. <laughs> but then I asked her to sit down on a, on a chair to see, to see if her, oh, she, I have to tell you what was wrong, right? Her knee was hurt. She had a, a problem with her knee. I don't know what, it, what, what the problem exactly was, but she said it felt loose. So she sat down. I asked her to sit down. I sat down with her. I checked if her legs were the same. It wasn't the same. And I prayed. I asked the Lord for, for him to lengthen. And guess what? It didn't lengthen. Can you imagine? So I made her stand up. I asked her, how does your knee feel now? And she moves it. I ask her, bend your knee. She bends her knee. She says, it's, it's getting better. Like it's, it really feel, it feels better. And she wants to turn around and leave. Now, obviously, if you know me, that's not me. I'm not going to let you leave. So I tell her, no, wait a minute. I'm going to pray for you again. And I pray again. And I pray a quick, a quick prayer, a simple prayer. And I ask her, Move your leg again. See if there's anything wrong. She starts moving, and she moves it again, and she looks up at me, and she says, it's better. There's nothing wrong anymore. Yes, amen. Like, we can get bored with that, with people being healed in our services, in our church. God healing people through us. We can get bored with that. But how many of you understand that's our responsibility to not get bored with that? To realize that that is impossible. The thing that happens when someone gets healed of anything is impossible. It's not able, it's not supposed to be able to be done through human hands, right? But the Lord works through us and we see people get healed and we do not get bored with that at all. 
Are you guys with me? We can get bored. Each and every single one of us, I know this for a fact, we can get bored with the supernatural of God. If we get comfortable with it, we start getting bored with it, and we start falling asleep in church, and we start, you know, taking out our phones and start looking at our phones because the word is being spoken and we've heard it before. We know this word. We start coming to church less. This is not you because you show up. But we start coming to church less. Um, even when, And it's, it's just a fact. If you, it's just a fact, right? Now I'm here. I wanna, yes, there we go. So... You see, when you get bored at the back there, you stop pressing buttons you're not supposed to press. But we can see, and, uh, and unfortunately this is a fact, that before COVID, more people came to church than after, after, the, after, after COVID. It's, a, it's just a fact. Is it, why? Because people got bored. <laughs> they started staying at home, started watching TV, started watching, thinking that they're gonna watch the, the service online. And it, it doesn't happen. People have stopped coming to church because they started becoming bored with Jesus. They don't realize it, but they became comfortable. They became familiar. I would really ask you, family, not to be, be that person, not to become familiar with the word, with being in church. Don't become familiar with the songs because the, the song sounds like we've sung it before, or it's the same verse being sung over and over again. Guard your heart against that. Do not become familiar with it. Like I, I say this again, when we come together to worship, and my, my brother who spoke this morning said it so beautifully at Clarinet, he said this beautiful thing. He says, we show up to church to hear the word, you know, to be fed by the word. He says, God shows up to church to hear us sing, to sing praises to him. Wow. That is beautiful because that's the truth. So there's no reason for us to start being bored by the same lyrics being sung over and over and over again. I promise you, God is not bored with that. He wants to hear you sing. He wants to hear your praises. Doesn't matter what you are praising. No, no, what you're saying, what's coming out of your mouth, right? It matters who you praise. <laughs> but what is coming out of your mouth, praises to God. You know, when we sing about it over again, you are good, you are good, you are good, you are good. It doesn't matter how many times we sing it over and over and over again. He still loves to hear it. Amen. Again, guard your hearts against becoming bored with Jesus. If you've been in the place where you prayed a lot, Make sure that you get back to that place. Make sure that you get back to the place where you are reading the word every single day. You want to know what is happening in every single verse. Amen? Hallelujah. That is all. Let's pray together. Father, we just th thank you for this evening. Lord, we thank you that you are just so, so wonderful. That you are, you are amazing. And we love you so much. Father, I pray for every person in this room right now, Lord Jesus, that you would ignite, ignite a, new, a new passion inside of them, a new passion inside of them. Father, I actually pray that you, that you show us how to keep our passion for you going, how to keep our fire for you growing, not just staying in one place, but growing, becoming a bigger fire, touching more lives. Father, I thank you for that right now. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you, yes, ignite us on the inside. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Family, would you just say, say to Jesus something? Just say, tell him that you love him this evening. Just tell him that you love him. Just, just speak to him just for a moment. Let's just let the Holy Spirit move uh, with, with you there where you are. I want you to, to just sit there, put your hands out in front of you and just receive from the Holy Spirit right now. He is in this place.
Jesus. We welcome you in this place, Holy Spirit. We welcome you in the room right now. And we thank you. We acknowledge your presence. Father, we just thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that you are faithful always, that you are always with us, that you never leave us, that you never forsake us, that you always stay the same. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we just love you, Lord. We thank you for that. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yes, we love you, Lord. mom for something and dad said yes now I'm in trouble
<laughs> I, wanna, I just want to read this quote. Is that okay? Just read one quote for you that I, that I saw in the week. This, this is awesome. It says this, that if, if, if boredom with Jesus is for us, it says, if it happens to any of us, it says, if it is true of any of us that we are bored with Jesus, it's a sure sign that we don't really know him. At least we don't know him nearly enough. This is knowing Jesus is like knowing Mount Everest. For those who know it, Everest increasingly thrills, confounds, delights, eludes, and exhilarates. If people are bored of Everest, it's because they're learning facts about it in their living room and not climbing it. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ivan. Yeah, oh, praise the Lord. So, I am excited that he never gets bored with me. Jesus never gets bored with me. Isn't that amazing? It doesn't matter how you feel or what your circumstances are or whatever it is, he doesn't get bored with you. So, this week, I just wanted to say Pastor Ivan has a birthday coming up on Wednesday. And so, it's Wednesday, yeah. And uh, he, he, him and, and uh, teacher Ari is going away for the week. And so we just want to wish you a happy birthday so long and that you may be blessed and that all your dreams may come true. All your prayer requests just flow in abundance. He's turning, he's turning into a double number. And, and the one number is the, 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 the fullness of God. And so he's got a double of that number. 44, ne? <laughs> Not really. 33, two threes, double threes, double anointing of God's fullness. And that we speak over him in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you. And then I got good news. Tomorrow is Monday. Be everything that God has called you to be. Amen. <laughs>